And as I mentioned today, our focus is on FGM and to set the pace for our discussion, let's listen to the voices of women who refused to undergo the cut. Especially December, that's when they, 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 they do the cut. So Babanga and Anisa too, tired and can be too, Apana, Bado. My sister, when she was getting married, same, same morning, ndo alitairiwa. Ali bleed. Akanikambia, oh my God. This is what girls go through. They bleed like this. Then, oh my God, I will not do this thing. Same, same day, ndo alipeleko kwa mze. I finished my primary school. I went to high school. Nikamaliza college. I'm a banker by professional. So 2010, nikajiriwa kazi. So that 2010 is where that now I met my husband. I took him home. I kinda come introduce my parents. So after that, story kaanza. The FGM sasa. When I was uh, in school, there is something I observed that uh, Maasai girls don't go far. They used to drop out in masses in class six, seven, eight. I learned about female genital circumcision and uh, its link to early pregnancies and school dropouts. I resolved that I will not marry a cat girl, I will fight female genital mutilation and I will work for women empowerment from my community. I had not met the girl I will marry by then. So I, made, uh, I set the bar very high for myself because all girls have been cut. Once we agreed that we will marry, I told her, yes, we will marry, but you will not go through this practice. You are not going to be cut. I broke the news to him. I told him, Dad, I know we are going to do the door renegotiation. Uh, this girl has not been cut, and I want to marry her and cut. Hell broke loose. <laughs> My father refused to eat the food that I had ordered. He became mad, furious. He started insulting me. So I told my uncles, they also started complaining, abusing me. How can you do this? And why, why are you telling us this? This is a shame. So I told them, now this is my choice. This is what I want. Let's go and negotiate Dory and let's leave girl circumcision to that far, family. That is the approach they used to convince my father to accept going. And we went to Marsabit. We were received very well. We started the process. It went down well, the number of cows, sheep and everything. It was a smooth discussion. My father-in-law, he pointed to me directly so he told me young man i want to tell you right now i can give you this girl for free as long as you allow me to perform fgm you cannot deny me the honor and there is a special uh, necklace they normally put on their head and apply some oil as a sign of blessing and they put some green grass and uh, they put on a special regalia showing that uh, they have performed an important cultural practice. And this is what my father was longing for. So I told them, allow me to pay their bride price, all their cows in January. And then in March, because we plan to marry in April, in March, Josephine will take a leave and then you will cut her one week, two weeks before our marriage date, the wedding day. They were very happy. They laughed. They were very excited. I could see everybody. My father was happy. Pressure. Pressure all over. From who and who? From my parents, from the community within, the villagers around, my, my relatives. Yani, tunayasa payana aje mstana nyaya tairiwa. Tunayasa aje kula shere ya mstana mwenyaya tairiwa. Kuna mama wamejitolea sasa. Kanza kuni book. Plus, I'm now. 
my mom alikuwa na yani baka ulcers baka hakuli chakula kwa sababu sasa baba anampatia pressure unaona msichana wako sasa ataka kunisikiza my dad alinikas kabisa akaambia mimi sipeani msichana yenye hajatairiwa sipeani laioni laioni ni mkijana mvulana my brother also was supporting me not to do it lakini sasa after all ameona sasa pressure ime, imekuwa mingi ya akajikata akasema nyinyi all the best so after, after mimi after sasa imekuwa too much imekuwa too much nikaambia pasanga can i just do it? can i wacha nifanye hiki tu hii pressure ishe i told her if you give in i will not marry you <laughs> i was that brutally honest so in january we went back home we went back to marsabit and i paid the bride price i knew by paying the dowry they will have given out their daughter because they have then consumed the bride price so what next <laughs> so it was a trick that i was playing dosa my dad ameona ah kweli msichana anaenda kabisa bila kufanywa hiyo kitu so imebaki 2 weeks ndio akaniambi akaniye mwenyewe ndo alinipigia simu akaniambia msichana wangu sasa kwa sababu umekataa you have won the the battle so i'm coming to give you out no what i did i cried kwa sikuwa naamini baba yangu anasanipeana kama sijafanywa hivyo Right, it's so beautiful to hear uh, such stories and also the fact that we have a man who says, listen, I am championing against female genital mutilation. So it's amazing to hear such stories and also to focus on the discussion and that is FGM, that is crisis within a crisis. And the question that we're asking you today is, do you think that the fight against female genital mutilation is achievable? Once again, is the fight to eliminate female genital mutilation, is it achievable? What do you think feel free to send us a tweet at ntv kenya at lubembe underscore winnie remember to use the hashtag new normal and tell us whether you think that the fight and that is to eliminate female genital mutilation is achievable and um again in june 2019 president huru kenyatta made a firm commitment to put an end to female genital mutilation by the year 2022 we are in 2022, so are we on track as far as eliminating female genital mutilation? That is what we'll be focusing on, and that is tracking the progress as far as the war on ending female genital mutilation is concerned. So do not want to miss any part of this discussion. If you want to chime in, again, feel free to send us a tweet on at ntvkenya at lubeme underscore winnie, or alternatively, uh, call us live. The numbers are down on your screen, and let's have a conversation as far as female genital mutilation. It's concerned, of course, to help us with the discussion. We have Mary Likama uh, Olo Dokilan, <laughs> Women <laughs> Network from Kajia Dosante Sana, yeah. uh, for coming to our studio today. Um, to, to the studio. Yeah. And also on Zoom, we have Aisha Roba, who is an FGM survivor. Good morning, Aisha. Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me. Thank you for making time for us. We really, really appreciate your time. And also later on, we'll be joined by Ndege Lugayo, who is a project manager from Amruf Health International Africa, right here in the country. So, asante sana for making time for us. And Mary, what are you doing now? So, we will get to our economic community. Yes. Do you have any questions? Yes, I have any questions. Kwa sababu nimekeketwa nikiwa hata sijui sijelewi ni mtoto mdogo na ikawa si kuweza kupata mwenye ambayo hata nionyesha njia ambaye ninaweza epuka na ukeketaji yeah mm -hmm. so nani alipeana ruhusa ya wewe kukeketwa na ni kwa nini um walikuwa nataka kukeketa eh kupeana ruhusa ya kukeketwa ni kama kimila yetu ya kimasai mm. kuna umri sasa ukiona msichana ameinuka kidogo mm. unaona sasa huyu sasa amefika umri yeah. ya kukeketwa mm. na baada hiyo umri ya kukeketwa mm. imefika mahali umekuwa mtu mzima mm. wa kupeanwa mm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so ruhusa ilikuwa ni wazazi waamue wafanye hivyo mm -hmm. sio 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 kujiamulia mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, na hiyo wakati ukiwa na mwaka 15 uh, <laughs> hauko na uwezo wa kusema hapana mimi sitaki sikuwa na uwezo ya kusema hapana mm -hmm. ilikuwa ni ufanyishwe vile ufanywe vile wanataka wenyewe 
ilikuwa uamuzi ni ya wazazi hakuna kitu mtoto anaweza jamulia mm -hmm. ya yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Um acha tuzungumze na Aisha alafu tutarejea kwako. Um, kuelewa sasa hiyo siku ilikuwa je unasema ilikuwa uchungu kabisa hauwezi hauna uwezo wote wa kusema hapana wewe ni mtoto. Yeah. Aisha, was this the case for you? Um okay, first I was cut when I was at the age of seven, and I was so excited about the cut because it was part of my culture and like girls of my age were already cut. So I was really excited to to, to, you know, uh, get cut that day. And actually the night prior, I couldn't sleep along with one of my cousins and friends who were just waiting for the day to come because it was something that we long awaited because um, we felt somehow incomplete to be part of the uh, community because already some of the girls that we were schooling together were already cut. So the consent, um, I was so young, I knew nothing about consent. All I knew was excitement and Yes, uh, my parents were the ones who decided uh, for me to be cut and I couldn't resist because I didn't know what FGM was. I didn't know the effects. The only thing I knew was FGM was part of my culture and FGM was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So before, yes. before you underwent the cut, right? And what you're saying is that you're excited. You're like, this is part of our culture. I'm excited to go through this. Mm -hmm. Had you had stories about, let's say, young girls who had undergone the cut? And if so, what were they saying? Um, okay, actually, there was no much discussion about FGM because what they believed is that it's a taboo subject to, you know, keep on talking about FGM. And the only thing I heard about FGM is that when you undergo the cut, you're being gifted. Uh, you have your neighbors visit you, your, your family members come to you, visit you. Uh, there's a goat or even a cow being slaughtered for you. And all I knew about FGM was the gifts and the visits from family and friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was all about the excitement of what was to come yes. after the act yes. is, is what really got you to, you know, looking forward to actually yes. undergoing the cut. Okay. Yes. So on that day, um, you know where you were supposed to undergo undergo the cut. Just paint a picture for us. Uh, what did it look like? How was how was that day? What was it? What was the process like? Okay, first um, I remember us waking up at around five a.m. in the morning, and uh, we were forced to take a really cold shower. And the funny bit is that my cousin and I went and bought our own razors. So um, I remember being pinned down by strong women. And the next thing I saw was being slashed and, you know, pool of blood. Actually, if you came near, you will have thought that it was, you know, some sort of animals being slaughtered around. So um, if I look back, all I remember is the agony, the pain, the blood, and, you know, the frustration that I underwent that same day. Mm -hmm. Because it involved, like, strong women forcing you down and, you know, um, pinning you and like full of trauma. All I remember about that day is trauma and bloodshed. Mm -hmm. I mean, even listening to you, um, you know, talking about the slash and pinning, it just sounds, you know. Um, yeah, so let's come back to, to Mary. Um, Mary, so Aisha, I'm going to talk about this Okay. I'm going to talk about this one. I'm going to talk about unaumizwa mwili ambayo haikuwa na e, mali popota ambayo imekatwa mm -hmm. so unakatwa una unapunguzwa sehemu fulani kwa mwili mm -hmm. ambayo sasa inafika mali damu inamwagika unasikia hiyo uchungu mm -hmm. the whole day mm -hmm. in fact wiki mzima unasikia hiyo uchungu mm -hmm. kitambo hiyo 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 jiraha mm -hmm. ianze ku, kuelekea kupona mm -hmm. so ilikuwa ni kitu ya uchungu sana ambayo in fact nikikumbuka mm -hmm. Sijui ni seme nini ni ile siwezi kupiga mm. tunduru mm. ni yani kama kila mtu angekuwa ananisikia mm. hata kama utakosa mahali pa kukimbilia hata afadhali ukasimame mstuni mm. Uko, usifanyiwe tu hivyo mm -hmm. so ni kitu ambayo ni kitu mbaya inaumiza mm -hmm. kwa sababu one damu yako inamwagika we mwenye unabaki na mauchungu mm -hmm. kitambo upone utakuwa umesikia uchungu sana na umeumia mm -hmm. so kukatwa sio kitu rahisi mm -hmm ni kitu ambayo inaumiza mwili. Mm -hmm. e, ijapokuwa wengine wanafurahia kwa sababu siku hiyo wewe ukikeketwa mm -hmm. wengine wanasherekea, wanakula, wanaenjoy. Sasa hiyo wewe unasikia uchungu, haukai, haukuli, mm -hmm. 
kwa sababu ya ile damu unapoona mm. so unakosa hakuna ladha yoyote ambayo uko nayo katika hiyo mm. sherehe hata kama ni yako ni yako lakini like wewe hauji unasema mm. watu wengine wana enjoy mm, wana enjoy na lakini wewe lakini wewe yani wewe ni mauchungu unasikia huku wengine wakisherekea mm. yeah okay yeah. so hiyo siku um, watu wangapi walikuwa hapo wakikusaidia waki kukeketa uh, mostly in, inafanywa na akina mama kwa yeah, ni akina mama so mm. nilikuwa ni watu watano kwa sababu kuna mwenye anakushika mgongo na mkono na kuna mwenye anakushika mwingine mguu na mwingine mguu mm. na mwenye ana, ana kukeketa mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. na wengine hapo kando wanasimama kama wawili wakiongoja maybe unaweza kuwa unaruka ruka wa kushikilie mm. wasaidia wengine ambao wanakushika mm -hmm. yeah okay so ukakeketwa kakeketwa kakeketwa ebu tuelezee hali ilikuwa aje after umekeketwa so after nimekeketwa ilikuwa ni hali ilikuwa tungumu mm. kwa sababu nilipomaliza kukeketwa mm. ilifika sasa mahali nimeonekana niko mtu mzima mm. in sasa huyu anafaa kuwa bibi ya mtu mm. so ikafika sasa nimepona ikawa Kilichuwa sasa muda gani kabla upone nilichukua muda ya wiki mbili ndio sasa nikapona. Mm. So baada ya hiyo kupona ikawa sasa ni mm, ataolewa kwa sababu amekuwa mtu mzima. Mm. Ikawa nimeingia nimerudishwa nimeingia tu shule nimerudi shuleni. Mm. Ika ilipofika mwaka moja iliyopita ikawa sasa naambiwa ninapeanwa. Mm. Na ni ndugu ya baba ndiye anafanya nini? Anaomba mzazi wangu baba yangu anipeane. Mm. So haikuwa hata uamuzi ya baba, mm. ilikuwa ni uamuzi mm. ya ndugu yeah. yake kwa sababu yeye anataka kutengeneza urafiki na nani? Na, na mtu mwenye anafaa kukuoa sasa. Yeah. Mm. So kwa ile hali Mungu akafungua tu njia. Mm. Likuwa tu naenda kanisa ya PCA. Mm. So nikaenda tu mi kanisani kwa namwambia Mungu mimi ninataka kusoma nataka tu kuwa mtu wa maana hata kama nimepitia mengi mm. lakini ninataka kuwa mtu wa maana. Mm. So nimeanza tu kuwa nimefunguka funguka kidogo. Mm. E, ikafika tu siku ika, nikaambiwa unajua sasa ninakupeana. Mm. Hata ninakumbuka ilikuwa saa tatu. asubuhi. Ya asubuhi. Ya Nikaitwa nikaambiwa ninakupeana. So e, huyu mzee ndio nakupatia na mwenye nilikuwa napewa nikikwambia mm. ni karibu rika na baba mm. alikuwa na miaka ngapi ilikuwa tu mzee nadhani alikuwa almost 50 years wow. mm -hmm. ah nikaambiwa nitapeana so nikasema mimi mimi sipeanwi mm -hmm. mimi siolewi mimi naso, naso. nasoma mm. so sikaingia sasa ile kufurutana huyu ndugu ya baba namwambia baba kwani mtoto ndiye atatutawala si sisi ndio tunamwamulia vile itakuwa sio yeye ndiye atatuamulia sisi ndio kusema na hivyo ndio itafanyika then mimi nikaenda kanisani nilipoenda kanisani nikakuta pasta mwingine alikuwa anaitwa Maina anaitwa Ndekei so nikamwelezea hii story akaniambia cuz mimi sina uwezo kuna ninasikianga tu shule inaitwa AIC ambayo Mrs. Nangurai huwa usaidia wasichana ambao wako for married. Mm. So vile utafanya mimi nitakusaidia na fair. Wewe ishi? Ishi. Yeah. Sasa mimi nikasaidiwa na fair mm. hata si kumwambia mamangu. Mm -hmm. Nikaondoka tu nikaenda. Mm. Kaenda mwezi mbili, mwezi moja, mwezi mbili, mwezi tatu hawajui ni kwa wapi wanakutafuta wata wananitafuta tu wanashindwa wanadhani niko kwa dada yangu so sasa mama mwingine akasema ni kama kuna siku nilisikia Mary akiongea na pasta so hebu muuliseni pasta mahali mahali ameenda so akalipo kuja kuuliza pasta pasta akawaambia huyo msichana ni kama ko shule ameenda shule ya IC mimi nikaenda ni shule nikasoma nikasoma ambayo ndio nimemaliza darasa la nane ikawa siku hiyo NGO ambayo walikuwa wananisaidia nao wakawa wamekuja okay. wangeweza kunisaidia mpaka okay. nimalize haya acha tuchukue simu halafu tutarejea na story yako kibet from bogoria good morning good morning madam thank you very much for calling us do you have a question do you have a, a comment as far as our topic of discussion today
Yes, I have a comment, madam. All right, go ahead. Yeah, there is, you see barren nowadays, especially in the pastoralist communities. Mm. Barren don't, don't marry their children, uh, don't entertain issues about these FGMs. Mm -hmm. But after a daughter, their daughter has been married off, daughters, uh, well, mama wanna keep, keep, wanna bend down for the, from the pressure, uh, the husbands were married, were circumcised, the man was to asima. Mm -hmm. I don't know why now I'm to above 18 years, what has you got me protected, I love to figure out how to get off and get off and get off the competition. I'm going to come to them. And then I'm going to come to them. 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 To Katai, I'm an FGM, Yes, madam. Uh, all right, I hear you. Asante Sana. Uh, thank you very much, Kibet, uh, for calling in and chiming in. And of course, we'll be joined in a little bit by Dr. Tamari Esho, uh, you know, who is the director that is NFGM Center of Excellence, uh, that is at Amref Health Africa. And of course, she'll be answering these questions because I hear what Kibet is saying. There's some women who bow down to the pressure that is of FGM. Even after the parents are like, it is okay, you do not have to go through the cut. But then again, they feel the pressure to undergo the cut. And Mary, um, I'm very sure you've also met some of these women, Wanasema. Mimi nataka. Amekuwa mwanamke mzima ana watoto wake lakini amesema bado anataka um kuketwa. And of course we will also looking into reasons some why some of these women would actually opt um for the same but Aisha for now let's just um talk to you about um you know that day when you and I went to the cut and for what you're saying is remembering that day is just full of trauma nothing else is just full of trauma. So then how long did it take um uh, before you healed and could you just take us through you know that process that is your healing process? Um, okay, um, I took like a month to recover and there's a lot involved in the healing process. Like I remember them digging holes and then putting hot charcoals in the hole with some herbs. Then um, you like remove all your clothes and then sit on the hole where they have dug and put the charcoal. That itself is, is a whole is a whole process and you know sitting on hot charcoal feeling the heat and sometimes you even get burnt in the process so i remember the healing process took like a month and they used to shower us with gifts so that we can forget about um okay. about what happened to us so the healing process took a whole month and i remember uh, there's one lady whom we were cut this, around the same period. And, you know, when during the healing process, they tie your legs together with, um, you know, rope. And you can imagine your legs being forced together, being tied, you not being able to move. Mm -hmm. And, like, it's, 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 it's so sad that uh, we had to go through all that. And mm -hmm. during the healing process also, the worst part was passing urine just imagine when you have a wound and something like acid is being put on your wound i'm sure it's so terrible mm -hmm. so uh it's as bad as it sounds and for the past like four days i wasn't able to you know pass urine i used to hold it and every time i feel like passing urine i used to cry i remember me holding my mom and telling her like if it was this painful why did i why why was it um, uh, necessary for you to to cut me and i remember us crying and you know putting like almost 10 liters of water around when we were passing urine and then we used to pour for the wound to cool down so it was a lot involved i can say that is painful that is painful. Wait, so yeah. uh, tying your legs and having you sit on a hot call with herbs, why? Why was that? You know, they used to say that it's for drying up the wound, you know, like when you your wound is being like uh, warmed, like when you, when you have, um, how do I put it, when when it's it's heated, they believe that it will dry up so quick. So that's why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there are some herbs that they used to put inside mm. the burning charcoal. Yeah. Why to prevent infections? 
to prevent infection. That is what they assumed. Okay. Whew. Okay. Um, but did it really help you to, to heal and recover faster? Because like you said, it took a month. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was like barely seven years. So to remember most of these things, yeah. I can't, I can't lie. I, I, I'm not quite sure if that is what helped me heal mm -hmm. so fast. Yeah. But there are some who took even three months. There are some whose um, wound could tear up in the process and they were forced to undergo, you know, some surgery. Mm. So, yeah, there's a lot involved. Okay. And and we, we understand. I mean, there are different types of cuts, which, again, um, Tamari will help us with. Uh, but for you, would you remember what type it was performed? I went, I underwent the type 1 FGM that involved the removal of the clitoris, mm -hmm. parts, some mm -hmm. parts of the clitoris, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But there are some who underwent type 3 FGM and like our older generation, like my parents, my aunties, and you know, the ones who are older than us, most of them underwent the type 3 FGM, which involved, you know, cutting everything. and the total removal, total removal of everything and then sewing up later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I think we've we've hosted one of the one of the ladies as well, um, Sadia. I think we all know Sadia uh, by now. She was very very vocal, and she was like, "Yeah, me, I went uh, type three, like total removal, and then sewing up, and it's just it's just horrific to just think about it." Um, but for you, Mary, was it again a total removal? I'm a part of it um, type that you under, underwent. Um. Sisi ya tujui, uh, uko kwetu ya wajui hile ya kukata okay. nuswa, ni kukata tu yote. Yote? Ya. Yeah. Halafu unashonwa? Awashoni. Awashoni. Unakatwa, inakaa, mbaka inashika na peke yake. Wow. Ya. Yeah. Okay. Wow, okay. So two weeks is what it took kabla upone. E ina, inachukua right? uh -huh. muda ya wiki mbili. Wiki mbili. Kwa sababu... Ah, wafungi vile ah, mm. wanafunga, mm -hmm. wanaacha tu ikiwa open, mm. inakuwa sasa tu unaosha, inaoshwa. Mm -hmm. So, na pia, hiyo wafungi, wana, wanaosha, unakuwa tu unaoshwa, unaoshwa, na kuna madawa, wanaosha na mm -hmm. ndo ipone araka. Okay. Yeah. Alright. So, ulitoroka, ukaenda, ukaenda... Ukaenda shule. Ukaenda shule. Ndiyo. Ukasoma mpaka... Class eight. Class eight. So he he period ukiwa ukiwa shule wazazi wako walikuwa na jaribu kukutafuta hawa kukupata until kuna mmoja akawambia mimi mwende mkaulize ule pasta anaweza joke ule uko. Eh. Mm -hmm. So ni walipouliza pasta akawaelezea ikawa sasa baba jarudi kushughulika mm -hmm. mama akashughulika mpaka akakuja akanipata. Mm -hmm. e, sasa ilikuwa kila likizo siendi nyumbani na kaa shuleni mm -hmm. hadi mpaka nikamaliza shule. So nilirudi tu nyumbani nikiwa nimesha maliza shule. Mm -hmm. e, ndiyo sasa ikawa, nimeenda tu, nikaka, nikaka, nikawa, nimekosa support ya kwenda secondary. Mm -hmm. Nilimaliza nikiwa na 317. Mm -hmm. So, ikawa basi siki, singe weza kupata mwenye ambaya ta nisponza, mm -hmm. nimalize na au sasa wakuwa na shukulika. Mm -hmm. Kwa sababu walikuwa bado na hele machungu. Ulitoroka, Ulitoroka nikakata mzee, mm -hmm. nikaenda. So waka, waka watu ni kuangaliwa, tu ni naangaliwa. Mm -hmm. But wakuna, awaku eza tena kuniforce. Hata mimi sasa nikaka, nikaka mbaka hadi nikapata hata mi mze. Mm -hmm. Nikaolewa, kiwa na 23 years. Mm -hmm. e, nikabarikiwa na boma na nikaka sasa sahi hata tuntio ni kwa, kwa hiyo boma yangu. Mm -hmm. First bono wangu nimepata 204. Mm -hmm. Sahi ya kwa first year university. Nice. So ninashukuru sana. Mm -hmm kwa sababu ya uwezo wa Mungu. Mm -hmm. Mahali nimefika nimeweza hata kusaidia wengine. Mm -hmm. Nimesaidia wengine kwa sababu hata nilikuwa na dada yangu mdogo hata yeye alikuwa apeanwe but kulikuwa bado na sasa hiyo uoga <laughs> imesaidia. Yu sasa wanaogopa ule Mary bado wako tu mm -hmm. na atatorosha huyu vile alijitorosha. <laughs> so akaogopa wakawa ni ile tu kuangalia lakini mm -hmm. wako na mpango. Sasa nikawaambia mimi I'm ready hata kama sina nguvu, mm -hmm. sina uwezo lakini huyo msichana ataso atasoma. Okay. So nikampeleka shule, amesoma, amemaliza, sahi anajifanya kazi. Nice. Okay. Yeah. All right. Aisha, so for you took a month um before you recovered. Um tell us through what happened after after you recovered. Were you married off um immediately after did it take some time or what happened? Okay, you see for us unlike um uh, the other communities like Masai and Samburu 
uh, it's not a rite of passage for us. It's a, they assume that it's a religious obligation. So FGM was done on me because they believed it was part of our religion and uh, it was Islamic. So I wasn't married off. I went to school after a month. Uh, they usually did it during the holidays so that you can have some time to heal over the holidays and then you're back to school like nothing happened. Mm. So I went back to school. I studied. I did, um, actually, I did communications and now I'm married with two kids. Mm -hmm. And my I have a daughter and my daughter will not be cut. Mm. I like that. Yeah. I, mean, I like that confidence. Like, my daughter will not be cut. And I like what Mary said as well. I went through yeah, it. So, uh, it was yeah. it was horrific. And she decided my sister will also not undergo the cut. So um, just let us go back to after you were cut. And, and like you said earlier on, remember you asked your mom, like, if it was this painful, why would you allow me to go through this, right? Um, so did you probably like talk to other young girls um, after you were cut and just telling them, listen, this is what it is. This is the process. And, uh, you know, just to let them know, just in case they want to go through it. Not really, because uh, we, I, I couldn't get that opportunity. You see, they assumed that it was a taboo subject first to speak against what they felt is so dear to them. So I started about, I started speaking about FGM when I gave birth to my first kid. He is now five years and I underwent like a lot of complications. I was forced to deliver through cesarean delivery. So it's really haunted me and I was forced to ask the doctors why I couldn't give birth through the normal delivery. And most of the responses that I got from the doctors were, because of FGM and most women in your community who have undergone FGM are uh, uh, usually give birth, you know, through cesarean delivery. So it's really disturbed me and I was forced to open a WhatsApp group and then join few of my friends and family members, young women. Then I got a lot of responses and I realized that a lot of young women, especially from my community, are suffering behind closed doors. They don't have an opportunity or even that safe space to speak on matters that, you know, affect them in different ways. Mm -hmm. So when I formed the WhatsApp group and realized that, you know, a lot is happening amongst women from my community, um, I was encouraged by my husband to start an organization and I named it Every Girl's Dream. It's a community-based organization because I believe it was the dream of every young girl or every woman to stay and cut and, you know, go to school. As my sister just mentioned, she was forced to, you know, uh, go out of school and, you know, get married. So what I saw is I believed it was the dream of every young woman and every girl to go to school, to get a good job and to marry the man of, of, of you know, her dreams. So um, since then, I have been advocating. I have been talking about FGM. Actually, some call me Aisha FGM. And <laughs> it's good. It's good because it's something that you are championing for based on what you went, um, you went through. But of course, I'm also um, curious to understand, have you ever faced any form of challenge um, as far as then advocating that is against female genital mutilation? We'll talk about that in just a moment. But for now, let's talk to Tamari uh, Esho, who is um, the director that is NFGM Center of Excellence that is at Amref Health Africa. It's so good to have you this morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you have follow a bit of the conversation um and what would you make of mary's um story because mary was like i did not want it i was very young only 15 and um i was forced to go through this and we also have uh, have aisha who's like i was excited to go through this because again our culture and of course like uh, she said based on religion so she was really really excited to go through this until she underwent the cut and she got to understand how painful and horrific the experience is what do you have to say tamari Thank you very much. Um, it is really uh, a sad, sad story that we hear in the field, and, and like Aisha has, has mentioned, and many other victims and survivors of FGM that they have to be subjected to in the name of culture. We know that female genital mutilation is a human rights violation, and hence we are working really hard in collaboration with government and different stakeholders to really fight and end FGM as soon as we are able to. 
Um, and President Uhuru Kenyatta actually said that, um, you know, that is on 4th of June 2019. Um, and he really, really made a firm um, con commitment that is to put an end to female genital mutilation by the year 2022. And of course, I'm just, we just want to understand, are we on track really as far as fighting uh, female genital mutilation? But before that, can we just understand the different types of um, FGM or the cuts that are there to just make it easier for people to understand? Because Mary says, I, it was a total cut for me. Um, and in our community, there's nothing like just a part of it. He's like completely cutting off while Aisha was like, just a part of it. Can we just go through the different types? Yes, yeah. So FGM comes in various types, like has already been mentioned. We have type 1 FGM that is called clitoridectomy. So in this type 1, mm -hmm. there's the cutting of uh, the clitoris and, and part of the prepuce of the female external genitalia. Mm -hmm. And then we have type 2 FGM, which uh, involves the cutting of the clitoris, the prepuce, and then parts of the labia minora. Mm -hmm. And then we also have type 3, which is called infibulation that has also been mentioned, that involves the cutting and also of all the female external genitalia, including also parts of the labia majora, and then the stitching together of the two sides or the uh, closing of the legs and tying of the legs so that the two sides of the labia majora he heals, creating a very small uh, opening of the vaginal, uh, vaginal opening. Mm -hmm. And then we have type four, which involves other types of, of, of you know, modifications, alterations, cutting, uh, you know, tattooing, uh, the pulling of the labia, uh, which falls under type four. Mm. So in Kenya, we have a lot of communities that actually practice type two FGM. Mm. And type two FGM, so that's about 85% of, of FGM that has been reported. Mm. Uh, this involves communities like the Kalenjin, the Kikuyu, um, you know, and then type Type one, we have um, the Kisses who practice type one FGM. Mm -hmm. And then we have type three FGM, which uh, involves communities like the West Pokot, uh, the Somalis amongst others. Mm -hmm. All right. Can we take a break on that note? Because it's just a lot um, to, to think about and just to picture. But of course, when we come back, we'd want to understand because today we just want to track the progress. Uh, because again, we celebrated uh, just recently, that is on Sunday, the International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. And of course, this um, with an aim to amplify and direct efforts that is in eliminating, um, you know, this practice. And of course, the hashtag that was used is invest, don't rest. We'll understand more on the same. But for now, let's take a break. If you still have more questions on the same, feel free to interact with us at NTV Kenya at Lubeme underscore Winnie. And we look forward to hear what you have to say as far as female genital mutilation is concerned. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Glad you're still with us. The show is Your World, and today it's all about female genital mutilation. And is it a crisis within a crisis? And the question that we're asking you today is, do you think that the fight that is towards eliminating female genital mutilation is achievable? Feel free to interact with us. There you go. The question is, is the fight to eliminate female genital mutilation and cut achievable? So feel free to interact with us at NTV Kenya at Lubembe underscore Winnie. 
and remember to use the hashtag new normal and tell us do you think this fight will be achievable and like i said earlier on president huru kenyatta made a very firm commitment to put an end to female genital mutilation in the country and that is by 2022 we are here 2022 is here with us so are we really on progress or on track as far as the ending female genital mutilation we'll find that out in just a moment and of course to help us with the discussion today we have mary likama who is an fgm survivor and also um you know um founder that is olo dikilan eh? we've been there group and uh, we also have um Aisha Bora who is an FGM survivor and of course also founder that is Every Girl's Dream and we also have Dr Tamari Esho who's director and FGM Center for Excellence that is at Ambrev Health Africa ladies thank you very much for staying with us but before we uh, continue with the discussion we have a caller on the line good morning good morning, good morning. hi Moses thank you very much for calling us all the way from Nandi do you have a question for us this morning Aha. Uh -huh. okay fgm thank you very much moses for calling in and of course uh, you know give us your feedback as far as female genital mutilation is concerned so keep calling the numbers are down on your screen and if you are able send us a tweet on at ntv kenya at lubeme underscore winnie remember to use the hashtag new normal and tell us what you feel about this whole aspect of female genital mutilation so many years later um and especially in the country where it was outlawed, I um, mean, you know, eight years ago, but it continues uh, amongst so many communities in the country. And now that we have COVID-19 pandemic, which has accelerated, you know, the number of um, cuts that are actually happening um, in the country and across the globe as well. So that is why we're asking you, do you think that the fight and that is to end female genital mutilation, is it achievable? Interact with us and tell us how you feel about this whole um, subject. But Dr. Tamari, can we talk to you um, as far as then? the international day that is a um, minute you know, of zero tolerance to female genital mutilation which was celebrated on 6th of february 2022 that was on sunday and of course the theme for this year was accelerating investment to end female genital mutilation so many questions are um, surrounding the same where it's always we hear this calls every single day to end female genital mutilation but sadly it is still uh, you know being performed Yeah, I think the main point there uh, is that uh, we are making progress. Uh, we may not be able to eliminate by 2022. Of course, we are already in 2022. We are working really hard with a lot of partners to prevent any new incidences of FGM amongst our women and girls. We know that Kenya has made very uh, strong commitments with regard to the end, end, end of uh, gender gender based violence by 2030 and also including female genital mutilation mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, money that has been committed to go towards pro protection of women and girls to go towards uh, pro uh, pro uh, provision of services for the survivors that are living with complications we've had earlier a lot of women that are living with different kinds of complications of fgm and then of course in terms of strengthening our legal and policy frameworks and supporting communities to understand the laws because Kenya has a prohibition of FGM Act that was enacted in 2011. We also have the Kenya Anti-FGM Board that is really coordinating and supporting the services, the interventions that are uh, going on within the country and of course working closely with different partners and different stakeholders, also grassroots organizations and women who are working at the community level are uh, also champions. So we, we, are, we are using multi-pronged approaches to really tackle this problem of FGM, working from government all the way down to the grassroots levels with the, 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 the relevant partners that we are having. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, we are also integrating FGM into the different kinds of um, uh, programs that we have. So we run programs around water sanitation and hygiene, and while in the communities, we are integrating the aspect of FGM in order to prevent 
uh, new cases to protect women and girls, and to also bring awareness with regard to if you're an FGM survivor, there is definitely help if you're suffering from any form of complications. Mm. So these are some of the things that we are doing in terms of strengthening and accelerating the achievement of the presidential declarations uh, that was made, uh, you mentioned in 2019. Mm. This was also repeated during the ICPD 2025, again in Nairobi. Um, and of course, we also had the launch of the generation equality forum commitments last year also that the president also spearheaded mm -hmm. all right um, and of course we'll also look at the various interventions that have been put in place to make sure that then again much as you said 2022 is here with us so really we might not be able to end uh, female genital mutilation in the country by 2022 but we're on progress we're on track and I like that so what else do we need to do to make sure that then we eliminate this by the year 2030 um, because again according to UNFPA they're saying about 2 million girls are actually at risk of undergoing the cut by 2030 so what can we do to stop this from happening and eliminating female genital mutilation in totality but for now Mary so we will say where the deco had a right um, I want us to go back because again like you said earlier on what we um, and especially in your community that is Maasai Kama hauja keketwa, wewe, you know, kuna vile, kuna vile utangaliwa, mm -hmm. hakuna heshima, yeah. ata, ata video nyo tuliona tukianza. Yeah. Uh, huyo mstena likuwa nasema, kulikuwa na pressure sana. Mm -hmm. Ya yeah, usipo keketwa, first of all, familia inashanga, sasa hii ya ibu yote inakuja kwetu, alafu, hatutapata mahari. Hautanuliwi. <laughs> Hautanuliwa, yeah. hakuna pesa and all those things. So wewe vile ulisema dada yako hata keketwa. Familia yako ilisema aje, majirani walisema aje. E, sasa nilipo sema hivyo, mm -hmm. hawa kuweza kuongea tena. Mm -hmm. Kwa sababu ya ile tu vile nilitoroka, wakawa, wakawa na hiyo ofu mm -hmm. ya ku, kutofanya ndo wapeleke mbele. Mm -hmm. So wakawa wameacha na wakanyamaza. Mm -hmm. Na nilisema, mimi nilisema hata watoto wangu hawata keketwa. Mm -hmm. One, mtoto kukeketwa hakuna digiri anapata. Na kun, kama ajakeketwa kuna kitu wamepungukiwa nae. So kila kitu wako sawa. Mm -hmm. Na unajua mtoto anapo keketwa. Mm -hmm. Wamasai wanamuambia amuka umekua mwanamke. Mm -hmm. So ndio inasababisha hata unakuta watoto wana, wana, inakua, wanatoka shule mapema. Kwa sababu wameona umekua wanake. Okay. Mm -hmm. e, una, unaanza kwenda kufanya ile kasi mwanamke anafanya. Mm -hmm. Na baada ya hiyo results zake ni mimba. Mm -hmm. Na baada ya mimba umesha toka shule. So, wanapo kaa wakiwa vile walivyo, hawaja keketwa. Kila mtu wanasema hui bado ni mtoto. mtoto. So, wanapata hii opportunity, wanasonga, wanasonga. wanasoma. Mm -hmm. So, kama vile action aid, wamekuja huko kwetu. Mm -hmm. Ndiyo wameza kuwa ngao kwetu. Mm -hmm. Kwa sababu, tumepata support. Najuu liku na shindwa utakimbilia wapi. Mm -hmm. By the way, lakini walipo kuja, tumekuwa na nguvu. Mm -hmm. Na kwa ukweli wanawake wamesimama, wamejua haki zao, wanasimamia, wakisema, hakuna kukeketwa. Mm. Ndiyo umesikia sasa kuna hiyo kikundi na hituwa ilodoklani women network. Mm. Wameshikana, wakipigana na ukeketaji na ndoa za mapema. mapema. Yeah. So, ikawa sasa wametusaidia. Wacha ni kuambia wametusaidia. Mm. So, hata sasa hakuna mtu sahi, mm. hata kama kuna hiyo ukeketaji. Wacha ni seme ni 20%. Mm. Ni ile ambayo inafichwa. Inafichwa kabisa. kabisa. Mm. Haiwanekani. Mm. Lakini ni kwa sababu ya hiyo. Ya action aid. Ile wamekuja. Wakatusaidia. Tukapata nguvu. Mm. Kwa sababu likuwa kisimama. Na seme kana. Ui mwanamke ni buwanake ndi ameshinda. Mm. Ndiyo sasa nakuja kutusumbua. Tutamuonyesha. Mm. So unakuwa. Hato ukona ile wofu. Kwa community. Unaogopa. Auna security. Mm -hmm. Eh. Unambiwa huyu ni nini? Sini buwanaka ameshindwa, ameshindwa na buwanake nyumbani. Mm -hmm. Sasa nakuja kutuambia nini sisi. Mm -hmm. So, ikawa inilipo sema hivyo, haka ajarudi kusumbuliwa. Mm -hmm. Na ajakosa buwana. Sasa hiyo ndi ajabu. <laughs> ni akwamba, ajakosa buwana, amepata buwana. Na amejifungua mtoto. Na mtoto ana shida. Yeah. So, hakuna ukeketaji, hakuna mm -hmm. kitu inasaidia. Mm -hmm. Hakuna. Mm -hmm. Iyata inapunguza. Mm -hmm. 
Eh, yeah. wacha mimi niseme inapunguza. Yeah. Kwa sababu ma, kimawazo inakupunguza kimawazo kwa sababu badala ikurudi, ikupeleke mbele inakurudisha nyuma. Yeah. Inaanza kukupatia mawazo ambayo haikusaidi. Yeah. So ninasema ukeketaji hakuna kamwe siku itafanya unless kama itafanywa kwa siri. Yeah. Nikiwa mimi sijajua kama Mary. Yeah. Nikitoka Lodo Clan. Yeah. Kwa sababu nimesimama imara come sun come water. Yeah ninasimama mm. wasichana wasikeketwe wasikeketwe yeah. i like that sasa wewe ulikeketwa na unajua changamoto zenye mm. mtu anapitia yeah. baada ya kukeketwa yeah. wewe kama mwanamke kama mzazi right um, ulipitia changamoto gani and especially kujifungua ama changamoto zozote zenye ulipitia baada ya kukeketwa e, baada ya kukeketwa mm. kwa ukweli kuna changamoto mm. hata wakati wa kujifungua unajifungua katika hali ngumu mm. kwa sababu ni ska inarudi tena kufanya nini? Ina, Kupa, inapasuka. Kupasuka tena. Mm. So unakuta kitamba hata upone tena badala ule mtoto unasikiliza uchungu mm. ambayo ni ska ndio inaanza tena kushika mm -hmm. kushikana. So unakuta hata mara mingi watu ukufa kwa sababu ya hiyo ska kila mara ikipasuka, mm. ikishoneka, ikipasuka, ikishoneka, ikipasuka, ikishoneka. Mm mpaka hadi saa ingine inashoneka inakataa kufunguka inakuwa kwa sababu mm -hmm. mtoto hatoki hatoki eh imefungika imefungika mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so kwa hiyo kwa ile changamoto ambayo tunapitia ni ya kwamba community wanataka wasichana ambayo wamekeketwa mm -hmm. kwa sababu in our culture hawataki kuona msichana ambaye hajakeketwa mm -hmm. lakini for now wacha si tuseme kwa ukweli Mungu ametusaidia. You action aid walipokuja walitusaidia. Mm. Na ninawashukuru nina sana. Hata mm. mimi sijui vile nda ile shukrani <laughs> ndawapatia action aid. Mm. So kwa hiyo changamoto ni changamoto mbaya kwa sababu haujui hata ukijifungua ujui kama utafaulu ama utaenda. Ama utafariki yeah. kwa sababu ya yeah, hiyo ska. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Okay and um, Aisha so again you decided to also come up with your own foundation to champion for all these girls. I mean not to just make sure that they achieve their dreams and and just go to school and like you said earlier on again eventually just marry men of their dreams other than you know having people to decide who you're going to marry and who you will not marry. Um any challenges that maybe you encountered in this fight against female genital mutilation for example in your community? Okay, um there are a lot of challenges. First, the community believes it is a taboo to speak about FGM as an issue. Mm -hmm. So coming out and speaking about FGM, you get a lot of backlash from your community, mm -hmm. including my own friends, some of my family members, some of the people that I used to, you know, people don't want to associate with you because you talk too much about FGM mm -hmm. and even some save your number as Aisha FGM. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenges are many, and uh, the main one is that one, the, the, the getting the, that black backlash from the community. And the other one is uh, most of the community members in my county uh, do it because it is religious, mm -hmm. especially in my community, the Borana community. We do because we believe it is part of um, you know Islam. Mm -hmm. And then we have confusions because we have two sets of religious leaders. Mm -hmm. You get a group of religious leaders that say FGM is religious, and the other group says it is not. You, you get so confused in the end because when you have a group of religious telling the community that FGM is not religious, and you have the other one telling the, com the same community FGM is, you know, not religious. So we have that confusion. and. It's the high time the religious leaders sit together as, as much as, um, you know, even uh, nationally, the religious leaders, the imams have come together and declared at the grassroots, we really have a very big challenge. As much as it has been declared by the religious leaders in Nairobi, maybe in Mombasa or nationwide or even in the world, we still have a challenge at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. We have some sets of religious who are confusing our community. Mm -hmm. And the other challenge is our county is a very vast county. It's, it's large. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as a young person or as a community-based organization that is being led by a young person, we don't have the resources to move around to, you know, go out and 
reach out to the community members who don't have access to televisions, who don't have access to internet, who don't get even a, an opportunity to watch such kind of conversations on the TV. Mm -hmm. So as a young organization, we have a really big challenge and we seek you know, donors like UNFP and other organizations to come on board and support us. Mm -hmm. I want to take this chance to thank um, organizations like UNFPA who have been there supporting us, you know, um, helping us to, uh, they have increased our advocacy uh, momentum mm -hmm. and organizations like Action 8 and um, the anti-FGM board and I want to take this chance also to, you know, recognize the effort that the government is putting in place. His Excellency, the President of Kenya, has declared no to FGM. Mm -hmm. And this is a really big opportunity in terms of, you know, advocating against FGM. We have the Gumigayo Declaration mm -hmm. for the Borana community. We have our elders who declared no to FGM in Moyale. Mm -hmm. So this is also another opportunity and also another challenge because you will have some set of elders mm -hmm. who don't want to abide by the laws that have been set by their you know, by their leaders or mm -hmm. by the leaders of the Council of Elders. So I think um, also for the young people, there has been a challenge before. The young people didn't used to have an opportunity mm -hmm. or a platform to discuss on certain issues. Mm -hmm. But now we have the Kenya Nimimi Initiative where I lead, I am the ambassador for Isiolo County, and it's a youth-led initiative. And that was started by the Ministry of Youth under the leadership of um, the CAS, CAS, Nadia Abdallah, and we had the launch of um, Kenya Nimimi back in December, 20th December uh, in 2020. And this shows that the government is committed, but the challenges lays with us. Mm -hmm. If as a community we are resistant, then that means we are not ready to end FGM. Okay. That is, if, if the community comes out and, you know, agrees to have the conversation of ending FGM, then F and FGM will end in our generation. Okay. But if we have the community, you know, members backlashing and not wanting to, to be part of this FGM conversation, then that becomes a really big challenge. And also, uh, we have uh, some community members not wanting to be part of this conversation because they are afraid to be stigmatized. Mm -hmm. We have survivors of FGM like me. The survivors don't want to come out and talk about oh. FGM as an issue that is affecting us. Uh -huh. But at least things are changing. We have a number of survivors who are coming out and you know giving their stories and saying that you know after I and I went to FGM, this happened to me. I got this and these complications. And when you talk as a survivor, you will find that so many people will listen to you. Your story will be received more than that of a person who has not been cut. Okay. So I want to urge, I'm finishing up, I want to mm -hmm. urge the community members, as we are trying to advocate for FGM, I, I mean against FGM, listen to survivor stories, listen to what story this survivor has and how this survivor has been affected. Then maybe by listening to a survivor, you might have a second thought of maybe if you want to have your daughter or even your family member undergo FGM, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Once you yeah. hear what someone went through, and of course the trauma and, you know, like you said earlier, own complications that come with it, um, again, might help, might help to change your mind as far as female genital mutilation is concerned. So Dr. Tamari, um, again, COVID-19 pandemic came and everything was brought to a standstill. But then again, during this period, um, you know, we've seen a lot uh, as far as the increase in the number of female genital mutilation. Can you just take us through this? And to what percentage have we seen the increase? Yeah, so uh, we know that uh, the, the, the culture of uh, female genital mutilation is affected by, uh, you know, the socio-ecological factors. Mm -hmm. And recently we've had the issue of COVID-19 really affecting women and girls. And this is because it increases the risks and the vulnerabilities because you saw, see girls were staying at home for longer, girls were, you know, not going to school. So the parents would be like, what are these kids doing here? So in some communities, they would be prepared for marriage and that, that meant that they would go through FGM so that they can be married. Of course, because of COVID-19, the major things that we found in our study that we conducted in AMREF is that there were livelihoods that were affected because of course, parents were staying home and uh, you know, with the work, work, working from home kind of directives, uh, business closing down. So socioeconomic, the economic aspects affected families a lot. And this meant that for families that were very desperate, they wanted to sell off their girls for marriage. Mm -hmm. And then of course, exposing them to FGM in the process. Mm -hmm. So we see that COVID-19 has uh, increased uh, the number of cases 
of girls that have undergone FGM. We saw uh, cases that were highlighted in West Pokot. We've seen cases highlighted in Migori, in Narok, in Kajiado, really because of F because of COVID-19. Mm. So. Uh, some of the lessons that we're learning from the COVID-19 pandemic is that we need to step up supporting grassroots organizations and survivors and champions that are really at the grassroots uh, that are able to actually access those communities, access the girls, because uh, a lot of organizations were shut down, self centered were, centers were shut down, uh, organizations like AMREP were not able to really do interventions like we usually do. So we needed to devise new ways of reaching the, the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And some of the other ways that we also devised was working with community health workers because community health workers were actually at the forefront of supporting uh, you know, the, the, the aspect of COVID-19 in terms of identifying uh, people that might be sick, re referring them to the uh, COVID-19 uh, centers, amongst others, even supporting the, 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 the ones that had died in terms of the burials. So we integrated our COVID-19 uh, FGMC interventions into the community health workers program mm -hmm. because they are the linkage between families and the health facilities so really strengthening their capacities. Mm -hmm. So like it has been mentioned earlier, uh, in, in order to really accelerate the abandonment of FGM, we need to invest more resources. And that has been the theme of this Zero Tolerance uh, uh, Day, International Day for FGM, that we've been pushing for. Investment, 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 so that we are able to reach and support mm -hmm. the grassroots uh, activists and champions that are really supporting us at the ground. Of course, working with the different kinds of uh, development programs, like I mentioned, working with the, the gender department, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, because also with teachers, it proved very crucial because teachers were, would be able to identify girls who did not return to school uh, after the, 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 the bans were lifted, the COVID bans were lifted, so that the girls could be followed up at the community so that we find where these girls are. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that also we've done is we, we are develop, we've developed a digital tracking tool. And this tracking tool is actually meant to track the girls who are right at the grassroots. We work with community health workers and teachers to identify these girls and to follow them up over a long duration of time to ensure that they are not exposed to FGM. Yeah. If they have been exposed to FGM already, uh, we are able to provide them the necessary support that they're, they're being given. Mm -hmm. The aspect of using survivors is really important, like has been mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we are also in our programs looking to, sub to, to develop survivor-centered um, approaches so that we're able to strengthen our linkages with survivors because they can tell the real stories of what is going on on the ground, what has happened to them, and hence they can be really good advocates. Mm -hmm. I like that. And earlier on, um, there's one caller who actually asked, I think it was Kibet, if I'm not wrong, um, who said, listen, there are some pastoralist communities um, out here who stand up with the girls and say, we will not allow our young girls to go through um, FGM, right? But then again, he also said, but there are some women who, uh, mature women actually, who in my and they feel the pressure to still go back and you know go through the cut so what would you have to say to this like what are some of the after interacting with I would say women for example on the ground or even women um, you know in different professions why why is it that some of them opt to go and go through the cut and does this actually push back the fight that is towards eliminating FGM yeah, so like we already know, uh, FGM is really deep, deeply embedded practice within these communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, women who, for some reason, and especially during uh, the Moi era, who supported girl-child education, who supported women to, to you know, to really uh, go to school and finish and, and get into career paths, we've seen an increase in women, a mature women who are going back to, you know, to, to, to have FGM. Mm -hmm. And this has been because of social pressure or husband pressure or mother-in-law pressure. And we see a lot of this increase in numbers during when we're going up to election period like we're going to now. Um, we've seen this amongst the Kipsigis communities. We've seen this amongst the Kikuyu communities uh, with people who are affiliating with particular religious sects. And, and, and this tells us that we need to really uh, scale up supporting communities to understand the risks and the dangers of FGM. 
and to change the social norms and the gender norms because this is also a practice that is associated with gender mm -hmm. and social norms. Mm -hmm. So we work with communities, we work with religious and cultural leaders, with men and boys, with women and girls, to really support them to change and to challenge the, the, the existing norms around FGM and change them to new norms that will protect and prevent FGM from happening for, for, to these women. Mm -hmm. Of course, women empowerment also is really key. Uh, to have programs that empower women so that they don't succumb to the social pressure or the husband pressure, and they're able to stand on their own and, and you know, defend themselves from the, 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 the coercion mm -hmm. to undergo FGM. Mm -hmm. We also are working with healthcare providers. Healthcare providers have been known to increase cases of medical, medicalized FGM. And this medicalized FGM is where um, a doctor, a nurse, a clinical officer, or any cadre of the healthcare professional, midwives who are supporting the cutting of, of women in the guise that they're preventing complications of FGM. So medical, medicalization of FGM is becoming a real problem that we're working with Ministry of Health and with healthcare professionals to build their capacity to be champions to end FGM also at their level because they're respected people within these communities. Mm. Of course, um, looking at different programs that we've seen to be successful, uh, for instance, the alternative rights of passage program that we've implemented in AMREF over the last many years. A lot of different organizations organizations have also implemented this. But what we did in AMREF is we, we went back and looked at the last 10 years of implementation of this specific intervention amongst communities that we did the intervention and those that we didn't do interventions of alternative rights, where there were other different kinds of interventions going on. And there was a big difference in the areas where we implemented the alternative rights of passage. Mm -hmm. And this is in Kajiado, okay. where we had a reduction of FGM, a reduction in child marriage, and even of teenage pregnancies. Mm -hmm. So scaling up some of these successful interventions and best practices is something that is needed. And of course, it needs investments. All right. Okay. You're really, really stressing all the investments <laughs> as far as resources are, you know, is concerned just to make sure that then again, you know, the fight and that is towards eliminating female genital mutilation is achieved. So we're taking a short break, but of course, when we come back, we'd also want to understand. So fine. Um, a lot of calls has been made in terms of let's join together. Let's join hands. All the communities need to join hands in fighting this. Um, again, governments also made a plea just far as uh, ending female genital mutilation. We're not there yet. What more needs to be done to make sure that we end this and how best can we involve the men. I know in Kajiado there's a lot, uh, you know, as far as involving the men, Kwakikisha Kwa, again, uh, you know, they, they're really, really championing against female genital mutilation. So then how best can we do this to make sure that then we um, eliminate female genital mutilation by 2030. So let's take that break. But of course, when we come back, we'll be looking at your feedback as far as what you have to say as far as female genital mutilation is concerned. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. Glad you're still with us. The show is your world. We are in the last phase of this show, and of course, we just want to find solutions, really. Because like we said, um, with the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of things were disrupted. And of course, cases of female genital mutilation were on the rise and have been reported to be on the rise amidst a pandemic. So we're asking, is this a crisis within a crisis? And is the war on eliminating or eliminating female genital mutilation achievable? That is what we're asking you today. Do you think the war on eliminating female genital mutilation, is it achievable? Feel free to uh, interact with us. I can see a number of your feedback, but of course, will be some them a little bit later uh, but for now let's take a look at this um, uncut voices that is the second part of uncut voices and then we'll come back and focus on the solutions what more do we need to do to make sure that we eliminate female genital mutilation by the year 2030 so take a look at this uh, my name is Aitun Abdullahi I am born and raised in Marti a village in Isiolo County Growing up here, 50% uh, of my girls of my age uh, underwent the female genital mutilation. I am lucky because my parents decided that I will not undergo the cut. My mom, um, she's not from this community. I was born in 
Mi nilikuwa na jitenga kilo wakati kwake sababu mi mwenye siku pitia yyo mamba FTM na siku kwa naelewa na niliolua ni kuwa young. Sasa nilikuwa na ogopa wakati ngine anitarau wa seme mi siyo mwana mketosha. Saa zingine nilikuwa na ogopa kimira culture yao pia mimi niambue ni pelekwe. Niko na wasichana watatu, kati wasichana angu walifika miaka kumi, tisa, nane, kulikuwa na presha nyingi, nyanya walikuwa nataka wapanyue hizo mambo wa FGM, lakini mimi nilikuwa sija kubariana na yeye, na kwa hii community kulikuwa ni lasma. Hata nikienda safari, ukifanya hivyo tutaposana na we kwa maisha, na naesa hata kukupeleka polisi. Na vile bwanangu alikuwa tumekubaliana na yeye yeye pia alikuwa akutaka. When I went to school and uh, I started talking to my friends and they now started sharing their experience. Uh, FGM has a lot of complications. Uh, for some it is immediately because when you're cut uh, you may overbleed and die. You're taken as a group of girls, and then you cut, your legs are tied, and then they, they dig a hole, and then uh, there's a traditional medicine that, that they put inside the, the, the holes. They light fire in that car hole, and, and you sit on it for, for almost one week, so that the, the wound can heal traditionally. When I started now advocacy work and I started reading about it and hearing stories of other women, so I was triggered and I started also uh, encouraging women in my community to share their stories. The stories were so, so sad and horrific. What motivates me to talk about my story is my late dad because for him, growing up, I've seen him uh, giving back to the community and working with the communities. They knew him as a person who, who used to talk about FGM. So they used just to say, uh, no, it is a dad who, who has also influenced the daughters to, to talk about these things. I never received that uh, backlash from the community. I went to campus, even far from my home. Now I'm working with um, a local organization, a Mirti Integrated Development Program as a girl officer. I'm simply working with adolescent girls, 10 to 19 years. They are the girls that who drop out, dropped out because of early marriages. And you know early marriages is connected to FGM. They undergo several trainings. Uh, life skills trainings, uh, sexual reproductive health, financial training, and changing their mindset and now uh, telling them that they are the ones now to, to, be to have that responsibility now because they have not gone to school but they need to take their kids to school. Mtila Chasang uh, Chepatula. I'm from the Pokot community and I'm an anti FGM uh, activist. I grew up at a time where FGM was a normal thing, where every girl older than myself had uh, gone through FGM. And in fact, all the older female members of my family have gone through FGM. I knew that uh, a time will come when I will be uh, put through FGM and I was so happy about it. I was so excited. I was looking forward to the day I'll be cut because of the attention you were given, the gifts, uh, the ceremony, the celebrations. The Pokot community, my community, they do the type 3 of FGM, which is called infibulation. And uh, it's done in two stages. There's a first stage and there's a second stage. The first stage is like a slight cut, slight cut. 
and this is where all the members of the public are allowed to witness. And then the second stage is done in a secluded place where only women who have gone through FGM participate. So I got a chance to sneak to the second stage where FGM, the, I call it the real cutting or the real butchering or the real FGM happens. My cousin was lying down there in a pool of blood and women had overpowered her. So she was screaming, but her screams were being covered by the singing. The circumciser was cutting you know, pieces of flesh from her body, from her genitals. So that, that's when reality hit me really hard. And I realized that it wasn't just the celebration and the attention you're given. So I ran all the way home and I questioned my mother. I just told her, I don't think I want to go through that thing. And she was like, okay, but I was not convinced. By the time I was about 12, I left home and I went to Ortum Girls, which was then a boarding, one of the best boarding primary schools around. And uh, I, I, like I hid there and they accepted me. And uh, because I was also doing very well in my, my uh, studies, so I became one of the best performing uh, people in that school. So I attracted like uh, attention from well wishers who even supported me through school, through primary school. All right, it's amazing to hear some of the women um, who did not undergo the cut actually just coming out and saying, listen, I was about to, but, you know, I, I, I did not go through it. And, you know, championing really um, as far as fighting or ending, eliminating that is female genital mutilation. And very quickly, because I can see our time, it's far much spent. And uh, Mary, um, so we're with Unawakna community. And, of course, one of the... Um, Group and your condani nature or Lodo Kilan, or Lodo Kilan women network. Um, na mnafanya nini kwa hiyo kwa hiyo group yenu kuhamasisha watu wengi uh, kuhusu female genital mutilation na haswa wanaume. Muna involve pia? Yeah. Yeah. So sisi tuna tunatumia workshops mm -hmm. tunawaita kwa mikutano mm -hmm. kama couples. Mm -hmm. Bwana na bibi. Mm. So tunaenda tunaongelesha, tunaelezea hatari ya ukeketaji, mm. hatari ya kupeana mtoto akiwa mdogo. mdogo. Na ni jinsi gani tunaweza wasaidia watoto wetu wasipitie katika hali ya ukeketaji. Mm. <coughs> so, so, sasa sisi tunatumia hiyo njia kuwaita wote so hakuna wale wanasomeshwa wana kando na wengine, na wengine wanasomeshwa kando tume, yeah. tume action aid wameweza kutusupport mm. hii activity wametenga iwe tunaita bwana na bibi mm. kwa sababu familia ni watu wawili mm -hmm. so the more wote wawili watakuja kusikia hatari ya ukeketaji mm. kwa hakika hakuna jinsi hiyo community itateketa tena mm -hmm. kwa sababu both parents wamesikia mm -hmm. atari ya kukeketa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I like that because majority of the times tunasikia tu ni mama ameitwa wameenda workshop wanaongea juu ya ukeketaji. I think it's because it has been majorly performed by women. But yeah. now mna involve pia wanaume couple yeah. nyinyi wote kujeni. Yeah. And Alafu to nyingine mm -hmm. tunaenda kwa mashule tunamazisha eh, watoto shuleni mm -hmm. ya kwamba ukitaka kuibiwa kukeketwa kwa sababu kuna hiyo ya wizi toroka ukuje shuleni toroka ukuje shuleni ama ukuje kwa women network mm -hmm. watakuokoa mm -hmm. so tumepata hiyo nafasi mzuri ambayo kwa kweli ndio nilikuwa nakwambia si mm -hmm. tunashukuru sana actioni kwa sababu wamekuja wakatufungua macho mm -hmm. so tumepata hiyo nafasi tunatembea kwa community mwingine mm -hmm. tumeweza sasa ku, kupata komiti mm -hmm. tumeshikanishwa na county mm -hmm. na actioni mm -hmm. So hiyo eh, komiti tumetengeneza kutoka eh, county level mpaka mm. grassroots. Mm. So sasa hivi tuko na hiyo kamati komiti ambayo inafanya hiyo kazi. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I, um, I'm sure umesikia wasichana wengine wanasema mimi nataka. Mm. Mimi nataka kukeketwa. Mm. Much as yes kuna a lot of information about dangers za kukeketwa mm. but bado kuna wale wengine wanasema mimi mimi nataka. Ninyi mm. experience to make experience, to make experience. Mm. Amata wanawake, wanawake yeah. machua. Mm -hmm. eh, kuna hiyo pressure. Mm -hmm. Ambayo ukienda ukae na wale ambayo wamekeketwa, unakuta wanasema, ha sisi ya tuwesi yoga na hui mustiana. Mm -hmm. Sisi ya tutaki, ya tutaki mustiana tukaribie. So una, unakuwa na hiyo pressure. Hata na we unaanza kusema, sasa nitakate yangu. 
wacha tu hata mimi nikeke tu nipate kukaa kama hao so tuna tuna tunawaelezea anga ya kwamba mtu akikwambia kitu hakuna kitu amekuambia mm. kwa sababu kukeketwa hakuna kitu ameongezewa mm. so ni vizuri tu ukae na mwili yako ikiwa mm. full mm -hmm. eh usi, usi yani usione hiyo pressure ambayo unaletewa mm -hmm. unaona kama ni kitu ambayo itakufunja moyo mm -hmm. Sio lazima hata ukae na yeye, lazima ukae na yeye. Zimeota must. Kaa <laughs> peke yako. Eh, utakata kwa sababu hata uko na wenzako wale ambao hawajakeketwa, utakaa nao nao wakae na wale wamekeketwa, wakae mm -hmm. naye basi kando. Mm -hmm. So hiyo kitu isikusukume. Tunamazishanga shuleni ya kwamba mm -hmm. usio mtu asikuambia ati ye amekeketwa ukae mbali na yeye. Mm -hmm. Kama ni shule ulikuja peke yako shule Tusome. na utaenda peke yako kwenu. Mm -hmm. So hakuna siku utaandamana na mtu. Mm -hmm. So ni vizuri kama mtu akikwambia hivyo kwanza uambie hatari ya kukeketwa. Yeah. Mm. Ebu okay. mwelezee mwenyewe hii hatari ambayo saa hii alikoredi kupitia mm. katika hiyo hali ambayo amekeketwa. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Aisha, um again, so what strategies are you using right now because like you said there's a lot of challenges, resources being one of them. You don't have enough resources to make sure that you know you go far and wide to preach this message and that is female genital mutilation. It's not good, it's not beneficial um at any given point. So what do you use um to make sure that you know you involve as many people as possible in the fight? Okay, uh, mostly we have dialogues with the community members, like we have um, a group of men, talk to them, and then we have a group of women, young people, like in Isiolo, we have a, a space for the young people, um, Isiolo Inno Youth Innovation Center, like uh, the space has been of use to us because like when before when you want to meet young people and talk to them, it will be a challenge because that means then you will have to procure a space like maybe go to a hotel or something. But now we have the innovation center in place and when we want to talk to the young people because we don't have resources, then we meet the young people there. And also we meet women, women who, whose children have undergone the cut, women whose children haven't undergone the cut. And then we have another strategy, strategy that we started. Mm -hmm. We've launched um, anti-FGM clubs in schools. And now we have two schools where we launched the clubs. We have Wabera Primary School and St. Kizito Primary School that is in Isiolo County. Actually, it's in the central part of the county. Mm -hmm. And we are looking forward to maybe getting other partners to come in and help us move around so that we can be able to launch those clubs in um the interior parts of the county mm -hmm. so what we are intending to do with the club is you know teaching them at a younger age that you know fgm is not good this is the effect that fgm has on a woman's body or a girl's body so when they learn they will know how to resist they will know that it is wrong for them to undergo the cut it is critical to have them on board from the beginning from mm -hmm. the word go mm -hmm. so that we don't come and start educating girls who have already undergone the cut mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. And also we have um, we have a survivors network in Isiolo mm -hmm. where we talk to these women survivors and then these survivors move around. And then we have a support group. You know, as survivors, oftentimes we face burnout and activists. So uh, we often limit uh, the survivors, talk to them, you know, encourage them and tell them that we are together in this journey. And it's a strategy that seems to really work for us. Mm -hmm are using the voices of the survivors and also not forgetting our elders because they they play a very important role in our community you know mm -hmm. talking to them uh sitting down with them telling them that you know our culture is beautiful also you can't come and ambush people and tell them that you know what this is a very bad culture your mm -hmm. culture is not good you know fgm is a thing of the past blah 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 mm -hmm. but we we use a strategy that can work for all of us mm -hmm. talking to them you know showing them that uh, when you do FGM on women, this is what happens to women. Mm. So we, um, we make sure that in our journey, we have everybody on board. Also, we work closely with the county government and all the NGOs that are around in Siolo, mm -hmm. not forgetting um, the National uh, Office of Gender. We really also work close with them and making sure that everybody is on board in this journey. Mm -hmm. And the local chiefs have played a very important role in terms of, you know, helping us uh, fast track cases of FGM and also in terms of reporting. Mm. So uh, in this journey, we have everybody on board and we are hoping that if not 2020, maybe in the next few years, because it's a journey and we can't you know, end FGM overnight, yeah. we are hoping that in the next few years to come, we'll mm. be able to 
say that we'll, we'll just, I'm hoping for a day that we look back and say, we Manage. have ended FGM and really mm. that is our dream we as an organization, as an individual and also as a county and as a country yeah. as well. Yeah, and we look forward to that day as well where we'll just be like FGM is a thing um, of the past. And Dr. Tamari, um, again, so what more needs to be done as far as making sure that we end female um, cases of female genital mutilation? Because amongst the things that, um, you know, have somewhat spurred the number of, um, let's say, young girls who go through female genital mutilation, one of them, um, they're saying, is rapid population growth, right? That has, again, uh, you know, somewhat accelerated the increase of fem female genital mutilation. So do you feel it's time to change tact, um, you know, and probably improvise, like, other strategies to make sure that then we help the fight against female genital mutilation? Exactly. You're very right. And everybody else, I agree with the, 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 the suggestions that have been mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that we need to change tact. Mm -hmm. And this means that we need to even use technology uh, to really address this issue, because at the moment, uh, we know that uh, we have the toll free lines, we have different kinds of, uh, you know, the, the government uh, lines, the 1195 that can be used. If someone feels that they are at risk, if someone knows anyone that is at risk, they can call mm -hmm. and then they can receive some help. Mm -hmm. We also need to strengthen uh, meaningful participation of the youth participation of survivors, like has been mentioned also earlier, mm -hmm. because these are the survivors with the energy, the youthful energy that they can use while on the ground, right at the grassroots where they live. We need to also strengthen girl-centered approaches, like also has been mentioned, using schools, uh, having anti-FGM clubs at the schools, working with both boys and girls so that they're all on the same page around the protection of girls from harmful practices. So this is also something that we need to scale up. Mm. We also need to scale up different uh, programs that have been uh, proven to be uh, promising. And this involves the alternative rites of passage that has been really good amongst the Maasai. We need to scale up in different communities, uh, the Samburu, the, the, you know, the Kalenjins. We need to really scale up this in, in the communities that practice FGM as a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. uh, so really targeted approaches are required. Mm -hmm. With regard to uh, cross-border FGM. We've seen also increasingly during this COVID pandemic that we've had an increase in cross-border FGM where Kenya shares borders with Uganda, with Tanzania, with Ethiopia, with even Somalia. Because when we have very strong laws within Kenya, it means that people may, might want to circumvent the law by going to areas where there is no very strong legal policy mm -hmm. frameworks to, to do so. So that also uh, says that we need to work with or strengthen community surveillance systems working with, uh, of course, religious leaders, uh, cultural leaders, women and girls, and even administrative authorities that are right at the grassroots to support this surveillance, to identify girls at risk and to uh, protect them. Mm. Uh, other approaches that we need to also strengthen are gender transformative approaches. Mm -hmm. And this is because FGM is a gender norms uh, kind of or problem and also is, is embedded in social norms. So we need approaches that also tackle the aspect in terms of changing community perceptions and attitudes around who is a, a, a woman, who is a complete woman, mm -hmm. um, so that we're able to change you know, those social norms mm -hmm. to protect the women and girls. So really intersectional approaches, working with different uh, you know, organizations and different departments within government also will be really good. Mm -hmm. I like that. And of course, what a way to end the show. And again, according to like 2020 annual report that is on FGM, there are more than 5.5 million girls and women, um, you know, who received prevention and protection as well as care services related to female genital mutilation. Some 42.5 million people made public declarations and that is to abandon female genital mutilation. And lastly, 361,808 girls were actually prevented from undergoing female genital mutilation. Of course, for all uh, what the panel really really insisted is the fact that we need to have like a collaborative approach and that is as far as the fight against female genital mutilation and make sure that we end this like Aisha said in a few years to come and just make it like a thing of the past so we have to say goodbye thank you very much for watching and of course a special thank you to my panel that is Mary Likama who is a member that is Olo Dikilan <laughs> Women Network Group and we also had uh, Aisha Roba an FGM survivor as well as a founder Every Girl's Dream and also Dr. Tamar Marie Esho, who is a director and female genital mutilation center for excellence at AMREF um, 
international, right? So thank you very much, ladies, for the conversation today. And I hope that you've learned a lot as far as the uh, fight against female genital mutilation is concerned. My name is Winnie Lubembe. A special thank you as well to everybody who made this show a success today. We say thank you. Have yourself a lovely day ahead. And I'll see you tomorrow morning for another topic right here on Your World. So make a date with us. But until then, as always, stay safe and God bless. See you tomorrow.